Tonight's special guest is John Edgar. John has just released a new book called Urban Legend. It's all about the life and the times of Sir Dove Meyer Robinson, a former mayor of Auckland City. Us baby boomers grew up in the shadow of this man and his exploits. We welcome John Edgar as our special guest on The Beat Goes On. Welcome to The Beat Goes On, John Edgar. Thank you, Gerard. And in fact, John, you've just scraped in as a baby boomer. Oh, I'm pleased I did. <laughs> Is that a good thing or a bad thing, you're wondering? Well, having, having worked with a number of the generations that come after, I'd like to think it was a good thing, actually. So you were born in 1960? Yes, that's right. Well, the Americans, they say it goes through to 1964, but the British say that a, you're a baby boomer, it all finishes at 1960. So uh, you'd remember a little bit about the Beatles, wouldn't you, as a small baby at uh, in 1960? You'd be I can remember some of the songs when I was a bit older. Yeah. There's a picture in the book of Robbie, because of course he, he was a bit infamous for receiving the Beatles. There were a lot of councillors that were opposed to that. Yeah. Uh, he said, oh no, they were a nice bunch of boys to me. Well, he uh, did all us baby boomers a great favour, because remember, uh, he really did give them a great welcome, didn't he? Yeah. It was, it was a great Now, John, you're here today for one sole reason. A labour of love, you've produced a book called Urban Legend, all about the life of Sir Dove Meyer Robinson. Now, for us baby boomers, we all remember Sir Dove Meyer Robinson. I mean, he was in the papers all the time, wasn't he? Yeah. Seemed to cause a stir everywhere he went. What interested you in Sir Dove Meyer Robinson? What uh, has made this a sort of a, a life's work? Uh, well, I think he was, in a, he was very unusual for New Zealand politics. I mean, he had a personality. I sometimes wonder whether some politicians now have one. <laughs> and he let it show. He yeah. could be quirky. He was very articulate. Uh, he had a charisma. Um, but perhaps most of all, he had actually good ideas, and I think that was another thing that separated him from other politicians, was he was actually a visionary, and very few of them could really call themselves that. And I think that's partly what fascinated me about him. Yeah, a lot of research. What was the pathway to you, to you thinking? Uh, many years ago, more than I'd like to remember maybe, yeah. um, I wrote a PhD in history and decided I needed someone who would be interesting as a topic, um, if it was to sustain my interest for the length of time that you write a thesis like that. Mm. And um, casting my eyes around a political figure, and he had recently been um, ousted from the mayoralty in 1980, and this was 1982, I made my first approach to him to see if he was interested, and uh, he was very keen, I think he was very flattered that someone wanted to write a PhD on his political career. So following that we met many times, mm. I interviewed him, I taped the interviews and um, gained a lot of knowledge about his life, not just his political life, the book explores his personal life as well. And also there was a huge part of his life before he became mayor because he came to the mayoralty late, he was uh, 58 when he became the mayor. So there was a lot of living done before then. What was your impression of uh, Sir Dub Meyer Robinson? Uh, witty. Witty? Uh, affable. I could see why he was a very good debater, because uh, he was pretty quick with the repartee. <laughs> um, and I liked his ideals. I think he, he endeavoured to do good things in office, and he accomplished a number of them. Sadly, not rapid rail, which was his great disappointment. Uh, but yes, overall, uh, I liked him. Of course, he's a complex character and there were uh, dark parts to him, um, as there are with most interesting people. And um, they, you know, that's also featured in the book. Now, you say the date of 1982, you started on the PhD, but it's 2012. That's quite a long gestation period. Exactly. I wouldn't like your viewers to think I took 30 years to actually write it. There were fits of and starts of writing. Mm. and long periods where I didn't work on it at all and um, you know there were a few publishers that were interested in the topic but didn't think that it would be commercially feasible um, but I have had a very good publishing experience with Hachet who have published it under the Hodamoa imprint and so finally it's it's done. He was a good businessman wasn't he? I mean the, most of his politics was allowed by the fact that he uh it was quite good at business. What did he do that made him so sort of um, 
able to fund all these political campaigns? Um, his success was actually as a manufacturer of um, children's clothing. He ran a four factory business called Child's Wear. Okay. That was where he made his fortune. He had had all sorts of ups and downs in the um, car industry and in the clothing industry beforehand. But he finally struck it right. He, he struck it right, yeah. um, in part because he managed to get an import license during the war, which was a bit like, I think, a license to print money. That was a lottery, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, and so he was able, it was difficult during the war to get the material, and you know some of the supply ships that would have been bringing it out were subject to what nasty things the German Navy would do. Um, but that was where he made his fortune. And it was a great company, not just for him. Um, there's a significant part of the book talks about how he ran it. It was a really a model company and did all sorts of great things for its employees, like um, childcare back in you know the 1940s and 50s. They didn't think of that, did no, they? No, but he did, because yeah. uh, that was him. It, you know, it didn't sort of matter what sphere you talked about. He was. He was ahead of his time, and he was as, a, as an employer and as a manufacturer. What's your biggest impression of when you tell people that you're um, writing a book about Sir Dovemeyer Robinson? What springs to mind instantly with most people? What do they uh, remember? Yeah, the rapid rail, but for some older uh, Aucklanders, his, you know, he wasn't successful ra with rapid rail, but he was very successful stopping that mad plan to dump raw sewage off Browns Island into the Gulf in the hope it wouldn't float back into the Waitemata Harbour. <laughs> it would have. It would have. He stopped that. So some people... So, so we'll just go over that idea again. They all voted that they would pump all the raw sewage out to Brown Island. Yeah. Was it Brown Island? And, and hopefully it would float out to sea. Yeah, into the Gulf. And he thought that that was the dumbest idea he's ever had. Yeah. And it was. <laughs> and all the tests they said were they're done. This is the... In those days there was a drainage board mainly um, appointed figures from the Auckland City Council, but some of the suburban boroughs. So they'd gone out in boats, dumped a whole lot of... Uh, no, that was the fascinating thing. <laughs> they said they had done tests, and it turned out none had been done. They were all theoretical, done in their office uh, in downtown Auckland. <laughs> and he very wisely uh, thought that this just didn't sound right. Mm. Um, and, and when you look at what we've got today, the result of what he started... The uh, the plants that uh, take the sewage and yeah I mean he, ha he he did pioneer a wonderful task didn't he he did and it was a technology that wasn't understood by the engineering even the engineers of the time it was an oxidation um, system that was being pioneered in California and being the internationalist he was which was rare for a local body yeah. politician he looked to elsewhere to solve a problem for Auckland now. What a childhood. I mean, I read the, um, the book and um, uh, it's 1901. He gets born into a Jewish family. I'm not sure how to pronounce the name. It was changed to uh, Robinson. It was Rabinovich. Rabinovich. So here he is, part of about eight or nine children, wasn't he? What a tough life. It was tough. It was, it was economically it was tough, uh, but it was also tough because he was bullied as a child at school by uh, mainly Protestant kids who had been taught that prejudice by their own parents and sad to say some of their own teachers and preachers. So if he was born in 1901 and around about 1906 he's running down the road being chased by lots, 40 boys at one stage yeah. calling out Jew boy, yeah. Jew boy and all those insults. Yeah and sheeny, sheeny, who killed Christ. It was tough but it wasn't just you know being chased, often it resulted in a fight. He was um, in the schoolyard uh, because it was confined. He couldn't get away. And he would, he would often end up in a fight with a bully. Um, and on one particular experience he relayed to me, um, he managed to fight back, tiny as he was, until the bully relented. Uh, but that was, you know, that wasn't sort of usual. Usually he was, uh, he was being meted out the violence. What made him uh, decide to come to New Zealand? Uh, the family came for a mixture of economic and health reasons. Mm. His mother's health wasn't good and the doctor had said a warmer climate would be better for her. Uh, but also they had a precarious economic existence in England. 
his father sort of eked out a living peddling uh, costume jewellery and then every so often they would advertise their house lot of furniture for sale uh, saying they were moving on which as Robbie said was a cock and bull story but the hope was and it usually worked out they'd make a small profit from selling the furniture and that also caused an interruption to his schooling because although he was born in Sheffield they moved all round the Midlands and as far south uh, as London at one time. And the father was extremely abusive wasn't he? He was tough, he was a, a tough complicated man himself, he, he was embittered by his own experiences in East Europe um, and he couldn't see his way to letting his kids sort of have any childish joy. Um, all those years later Robbie still talked about how he had um, forbidden them to have a a guy on bonfire night um, and he'd rip up uh, any comics or penny dreadfuls that he caught the kids reading because he didn't think that that was worthy of their of their reading. Now he arrived in New Zealand in 1914 so um, he must have been about 13 at the stage. He was 13 and the contrast between the English part of his childhood and the New Zealand part couldn't have been more extreme. What happened here to make that uh, so wonderful? Uh, there was no anti-Semitism amongst the kids at Devonport Primary where he attended, or the teachers, um, and they were economically a bit better off. Uh, they didn't need to move around like they had, um, and he quickly fell in love with New Zealand and particularly Auckland's beaches uh, and was allowed to camp out on them both in Devonport and later on at Koei Marama, uh, and I think that that was that was the beginning of the love affair he had for the city. He also had a love affair for the ladies, didn't he? He certainly did. So <laughs> there's no doubt about that. And you know, a lot of the book is, is is devoted to what turned out to be a pretty complicated personal life with four wives and many girlfriends. Did you ever get to the bottom of that in his in your chats with him about why he? Um... The fourth marriage was interesting in the sense it was the only one he was faithful during, mm. and the one actually he didn't end. Uh, but the rest of them, I, I, I gathered that he um, simply liked to move on to greener pastures and, and grew tired of people who were, you know, that he was in love with some of the time, you know, for a part of the time. So how did he get into politics? What happened that made him step into politics? Uh, it was the battle over stopping the Browns Island scheme, as it was called. And he wasn't a politician, he was just simply a citizen told by a neighbour, because he had bought a place in Riddell uh, Road, you know, out there's Browns Island and that's where they're going to dump the raw sewage. And it sort of, you know, that, that short conversation uh, led him in the end to head what was called the Drainage League, which was one of the first, if not the first, group of citizens who fought an environmental battle. Uh, so he had to take on the political establishment and the engineering establishment and in the end he realised the only way he could do that is if he formed a ticket and contested the 1953 elections and became the group of them, held the balance of power and exploited it so that they could get positions on the drainage board and in effect stop the scheme. Uh, and he realised that uh, they needed to have political power and in the 1953 elections uh, he and his group managed to gain the balance of power on the Auckland City Council and they exploited that uh, and used it, that advantage to get positions on the drainage board that was responsible for the scheme and they stopped it and implemented the oxidation one instead. So that was a huge victory and it was the beginning of a political career. It whetted his appetite and it wasn't um, that long after I guess that um, he then sought the mayoralty. Now he certainly hogged the headlines, didn't he? Because I remember as a child growing up, Sir Dovemeyer Robinson this and Sir Dovemeyer Robinson, he really, just about every day. I mean, they, you don't see Len Brown in the paper, anywhere near the way uh, Sir Dovemeyer Robinson was in the paper every day. I think mid 20th century, politicians weren't as adept as photo opportunists, but he was. He was like one of the pioneers and I think because he had a bit of a zany streak to him um, and would do things to advertise the city or events going on in it, he was kind of a natural focus for the media. 
Now, his other big campaign, of course, was rapid rail, and yet he, he, he failed at that. And today's mayor is also uh, finding it very difficult too. So nothing's really changed, has it? No, I think if <laughs> Robbie were still alive, he, I say in the book he would have had a sense of deja vu when you know, the present government reacted mildly, or <laughs> not even that, um, to the plans to to start a rapid transit scheme. So what was the catalyst for you to finish this particular PhD, put it all together and get it out? What was it happening in your life that said, I better do this, I better get it done? What happened? Um, the PhD was actually finished, I have to say, on yes. time, a long time ago. Yes, exactly. Uh, the book hung around me, um, but a very recently his daughter Heather Levesque offered uh, to let me read the correspondence between her and her father. Uh, and I think it was that and also the sort of currency he has at the moment because of the uh, debate over rapid rail uh, that I thought well it's time that it, that it, that it, that it happen and, and happily it has. Well, we are getting to the time where if we don't write about him soon, most of our generation will have gone and we'll have forgotten all about um, Sir Dubmire, wouldn't we? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I suppose that was one of the other reasons. Was mm. It was such a fascinating life um, and such a, you know, he did, despite failing with rapid rail, he did other mm. excellent things and I think it needed to be recorded. And it is funny reading the book about how small Auckland City actually was. Um, down the road was the Newmarket Borough Council. Just up the road there was another borough, the One Tree Hill Borough Council, and then there was the Only Hunger Borough Council. So really there was just these fiefdoms all around, wasn't there, or fiefdoms? There were 32 of them. Robbie's Auckland City Council was a decent size, um, but it grew bigger when some of these other little uh, rats and mice, as yeah. they were called, of the local government were compulsorily amalgamated. John, who would love this book? Uh, well, I think people who are interested in a, in a well, I'd like to think, well-written biography. Um, <laughs> it is well-written. I've, I've loved what I've read so far. Um, people who have an interest in Auckland and, a, and in environmental politics, whether they live in Auckland or not. Uh, I think people who are interested, obviously, in political history, but um, there's a lot of social history in it as well. Mm. And he did lots of things before he became a politician. So there's, there's, you know, quite a lot about things like he was an early travelling salesman, for instance, and uh, what it was like to do that right across New Zealand, um, and his efforts are successful to become a manufacturer. I'd like to think a lot of people would be interested in reading it. Well, John, we have the great pleasure tonight. We're going to give away three copies. And we're going to ask our viewers uh, if they would like a copy, and I'm sure they would, to uh, email Jared at The Beat Goes On and to simply put in the subject line the answer to a question which you and I are going to work out. Now, I have mentioned that he was born in 1901. I think that's a good question, isn't it? What year was Sir Dovemeyer Robinson born? In England, of course, but it was 1901. There's a good clue. <laughs> <laughs> so get those entries in fast. And John, is there another book in the making or is there only one book in John Edgar? Uh, I'd like to think there's more than one. <laughs> I just have to be a bit quicker about writing it, that's all. Uh, well, you've got the process now, haven't you? Yeah. Now, the other thing, John, if you don't win the contest, uh, you've got to be able to buy this book. So where would you buy this wonderful book? Uh, most of the bookstores have it. All good bookstores, yeah. they say. Yeah. I wonder always what that means, all good bookstores. What's a bad st bookstore like? Uh, one that doesn't have that. <laughs> That's dead right. John Edgar, we're going to see you when you write your next book, which is so start writing. <laughs>